the Dharma is something really special. Because people who are not truthful, people who are not honest, can't practice it. You have to bring truthfulness to the listening to the Dharma, to the practice of the Dharma, if you want to gain any attainment in the Dharma. Otherwise things get directed off course. So if you want to start practice with the Dharma, you have to look at the areas where you already are truthful to yourself and spread out from there. Because a lot of our ignorance lies in the areas where the mind lies to itself. It doesn't want to be honest to itself about its motives for its actions or about the results of its actions. And that, of course, leads to suffering. So we have to find an approach that allows us to get around that willed ignorance, around those areas where the mind lies to itself. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that when we do something we know is unskillful, we tend to judge ourselves rather than the action. And we don't like being judged as horrible people, or shoddy people, or lazy people, or whatever the particular action is. And so one way around that is to make sure that when you're judging an action, you keep it at the action, not judge the person. The Buddha doesn't encourage you to look at yourself as a bad person. He tries to encourage you, say, okay, you have what it takes to practice, but you've got these bad habits, you've got these bad actions. He doesn't have you deny that they're bad and to recognize that they're bad is not a form of aversion. It's a form of heedfulness, which is the beginning of all that's skillful, realizing if you keep on acting in unskillful ways, you're going to suffer, the people around you are going to suffer. But keep it on that level, just the action. And when you see it as simply actions, then there's nothing inherently wrong with you, because nothing can't be changed. Actions can be changed, choices can be changed. That's why we're here training the mind, because our actions do come out of the mind. Again, the Buddha never talks about what the mind is, and he certainly never says that the mind is basically good or basically bad. And John Cha, in one of his finer turns of phrase, says, What is the mind? The mind isn't is anything. And that reflects the Buddha's attitude, which he doesn't talk about what the mind is. He tells a lot, though, about what the mind does. And that's where we can make changes, like we're sitting here right now, focusing on the breath. You find the mind wandering off. As soon as you catch the mind wandering off, you have a choice. You can allow it to wander a little bit further to see what it can dig up, we'll overturn a few stones, or you're going to get right back to the breath. There's a choice right there. And you also have the choice of berating yourself for wandering off or whatever. You don't have to do that. Just notice, okay, it's wandering off, come back. And as for any other extraneous conversation in the mind about what this wandering off means and what it tells you about yourself, you say, I don't need that. All you have to do is recognize that the wandering off is not what you want right now, and you come back. And you've got a good place to come back to. You can work with the breath. You can make the breath comfortable. Try some good deep in and out breaths for a while to just ventilate the body and to make the breathing process really obvious and blatant. And then pose that question in the mind, what kind of breathing would feel good now? How about this breath? And then this breath, and keep it up. Sometimes you find that a regular rhythm feels good, and other times you find that one breath will have energized one part of the body, but the next breath will have to energize a part that was missed by the last one. For 
some reason, I don't know why, but every time I think about this way of approaching the breath, it reminds me of one time when I was at Wada Sokaram, my first year as a monk, and there were two or three dogs that came out around to my hut after each meal. And if I just put the food down, one dog would dominate the group, and the other two wouldn't get any food at all. So I was very careful to keep them separate. I'd throw food to each of the different dogs, made sure that everybody got fed. And you want to take the same attitude toward your breath. Sometimes one breath will nourish the torso, but you're missing the legs. Okay, so the next time around, you work with the legs, or the arms, or the shoulders, or the head. Just notice which part of the body seems to be missing out on the, the share of energy, and work with that. And working with the breath this way gives you a lot of tools you need for dealing with unskillful habits, because it gives you a good place to stay, a place where you can feel good about being right here. And then when the, the idea of following through an unskillful habit comes up, you can say, look, I've got something much better here. Why bother with that? Because often an unskillful habit comes from a sense of irritation or dis-ease or just discomfort here in the present moment. And we tend to react to that discomfort in an old way. It may not be the best way, but it's something we're familiar with. And part of the mind seems to think, well, it's a natural connection. But working with the breath can help break that connection. So you've got a desire for a cigarette or a desire for something you know you shouldn't be doing. Ask yourself physically, where do you feel that desire? What how does it manifest in the body? You may notice a pattern of tension in the back of your hands, in your stomach, or whatever. And if you've been working with the breath, you know I can deal with that pattern of tension in a different way. Breathe with it. Breathe through it. Allow that sense of ease, dis-ease, <clears throat> allow that sense of disease to disperse. And you find you've got a new ally, a new way of dealing with those feelings, a new habit, a better habit to replace the old one. And then once you've got this new habit, then you can look more carefully at what are some of the drawbacks of that old habit, realizing that you don't have to go there. <coughs> The next time it comes up, you can just breathe right through it again. And then if part of the mind starts arguing and says, well, I really prefer that other old way of doing things, just you can sit down and talk to it. Like that great passage in a John Lee's autobiography where he's planning to disrobe. So he sits down and asks, well, what would actually happen if I disrobed? And he goes through the whole story, and in the beginning it sounds really good, but after a while, reality kicks in. And things get so bad in his imaginary story that he hears himself say, Boy, I wish I hadn't disrobed. And he realizes, Well, I haven't disrobed. Here I am. And that helped to disperse a lot of the, the appeal of his desire to disrobe. This is what you want to do, because a lot of your habits, even though part of you doesn't like them, there's another part that finds them appealing. And you've got to really look at that carefully and point out to yourself, hey, this, doesn't, this doesn't work. It's not nearly as appealing as you might have thought. This particular tactic is especially helpful when you do have the alternative of the breath, a sense of well-being in the present moment that you've learned how to maintain, that you've learned how to cherish. Sometimes people get critical of being stuck, say, on concentration or stuck on the comfort of the meditation. But it's a useful getting it's a useful place to be stuck. It's a useful place to be attached. Because if you're not attached to this, you find yourself going back to your old habits. It's like having new food to eat. There's no way you're gonna give up your junk food unless you've got better food to eat. So here it is, better food.
So when you think about your habits, remind, remind yourself that habits come out of the mind. They're a result of mental actions, certain ways we react to certain stimuli. And they seem to be in an ironclad connection. Once the stimulus comes in, you've got to act in that way. Well, you don't. You've got the choice. And when you provide yourself with alternatives, then you can start arguing back with the parts of the mind that come up with all kinds of arguments, saying, well, if you're not going to give in today, but you're going to give in tomorrow, so you might as well give in now. So you tell yourself, well, tomorrow's going to take care of tomorrow. I'm responsible for right now. At least have one choice right now, so let's make it the best choice. And the next time the question comes up, okay, here's another chance to make a good choice. And you don't make yourself any promises for tomorrow, but you do promise yourself right now, right now, right now. And as long as you're with right now, you're taking care of all of time. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Just worry about right now. This breath. The sense of ease you can get from this breath. Your ability to maximize that ease with this breath. When you focus right here, you find that these habits that seem to be so hard to kick get a lot more manageable. Especially we can look at them not as an indication of what kind of person you are, but simply here's an action that gets bad results. And you have the choice that you don't have to follow that action. You don't have to suffer those bad results. You're learning how to take the principle of cause and effect and turn it to your own advantage. The more truthful you are about exactly why a particular habit appeals to you and what leads you to do unskillful things, the more you see this other truth that you do have the choice not to do those things. This is where being truthful helps to reveal truths that you otherwise wouldn't have known. Because it's only when you're true that these other things going on in the mind, these other opportunities, become apparent. 